Hey guys, welcome back to another video. So today we're going to be talking about forces. And typically when we talk about forces, it's usually in the context of equilibrium. So if I were to have a box like this, and I were to apply a force in this direction of 100 newtons, and then let's say that we also have an opposing frictional force in this direction of 20 newtons. So the first thing that we notice is that both of these forces point along the negative x and positive x directions, meaning that they are both aligned with the x-axis, and therefore we refer to this kind of problem as a one-dimensional problem. So whenever we apply equilibrium, whenever we take the sum of the forces, we simply take the magnitudes of both of these forces and we add and subtract them. So in this case, it comes out to 100 newtons minus 20 newtons. But the problem with thinking about things in one dimension is that we lose this notion that forces are really vectors. They're not necessarily magnitudes. So what if I were to load my box like this? If I applied a force in this direction of 100 newtons and I had a frictional force of 30 newtons in this direction, can I still take the sum of the forces equal to 100 minus 30? Well, technically we could do this, but we're not gonna get the right answer. And that's because forces, no matter what dimension we are considering, should always be thought of as vectors. They have a magnitude and they have a direction. So yes, size does matter. But before some of you guys get discouraged, the direction or angle that they point also matters. So to do these multi-dimensional force balances, to be able to take the sum of the forces whenever we are dealing with more than one dimension, we have to take in consideration not only the size of our forces, but also the directions in which they point. So we must introduce this idea of the components of a force. So the formal definition of a component of a force is the magnitude of that force and the direction of a given coordinate axis. So here we have two axes, the x and y axis, meaning that we have two components to this force we have the x component, which is the magnitude of force in this direction, or this line, and we also have the y component, which is the magnitude of our force in this direction, or Fy. And typically, we express our vector, our force vector F, as a vector that is composed of its components, Fx, Fy meaning we go fx this amount in this direction, and then we go fy in the y direction. So right here, I have a scale. If I were to apply 100 newtons to the scale, then what my scale would read is 100 newtons. So let's say that we take two scales and arrange them like this, and then let's also throw a box on top of it. And let's pretend that this box is massless, so both of our scales read zero right now, or in other words, there are no forces acting on our scales. So let's consider the case where I push straight down onto this box. What would both of the scales read? Well, if I apply 100 newtons, then the scales would look like this. Now, it makes sense that this vertical scale on the right would show a zero force because there's no component of the applied 100 newtons that is in the x direction towards this scale. So basically what I'm saying is that this force is not pushing this box against this scale. It is only pushing this box against the bottom scale. And that is why the bottom scale shows the entire force of 100 newtons and the right scale shows zero. No matter how I push on this box, both of my scales are going to show the components of that force. Now what if I push the box in this direction? So now our force has no component pointing downward. Therefore the scales are going to look like this. And that is because there is no component of this force that goes in this direction. So in our xy plane, our force lies entirely in the x-axis, meaning that it only has a component in the x-direction and no component in the y-direction, which means that our bottom scale is going to have zero and our vertical scale on the right is going to show the entire force because the entire magnitude of this force points directly at this vertical scale. Now let's get a little bit crazy here. Let's say that I decide to push on the box at a slight angle like this. So our box is going to naturally travel in the direction that we apply our force or the direction that we push it. So anyway, if I push this box diagonally like I have shown along this force, then that means that this box is being pressed against both of these scales, which means that both of these scales are going to have non-zero values. In fact, we can also reason that since this force is predominantly facing downwards, then this bottom scale is going to have a higher number than this vertical scale on the right. In fact, we may see numbers like this. 
maybe this says 90, and maybe this says 10. But this bottom scale is going to read a higher value than this right scale, and that's because there is a greater component of this force in the direction downward than there is to the right. And we can verify that by drawing out these components. The component of the force pushing the box against this right scale can be represented by this purple arrow right here. And similarly, the component of this force pushing the box against the bottom scale can be represented by this purple arrow right here. And we can see that this force pushing the box downward is much greater than the force pushing it to the right. So the Y component is greater than the X component in this case. And that is reflected by these scale values right here. So let's take a look at this force right here. We can see that this force will want to push this box more towards the right than it will downward. So since this box is being mainly pressed up against this vertical right scale, this scale is going to have the larger number and this bottom scale is going to have the smaller number. And again, this is reflected by the components of this force. So if I were to project this force down onto the x-axis, it has a component that points like this, meaning that this force F has a magnitude of Fx shown in purple in this direction and it has a magnitude of Fy in this direction. And because of the angle of this force, because this angle is more oriented with the horizontal, then this Fx is going to be greater than Fy, which is reflected by our scales and the notion that the box is going to want to move more towards the scale on the right. So now that we know a little more about the components of a force, we can start representing our force F as a vector of its components. So let's revisit the initial problem that we started with. How can we do a force balance in two or three dimensions? So we've already established that we can't just subtract and add the magnitudes of these vectors, but what we can do is we can add and subtract the components of these vectors. So the sum of the forces in this particular problem just becomes the sum of the vectors. So what this leaves me with is two equations rather than one. I get the sum of the forces in the x direction and the sum of the forces in the y direction, where these two equations come from summing up the components of our two vectors. So in three dimensions, I would have three equations. I would have the summation of the forces in the x direction, a summation of forces in the y direction, and the summation of the forces in the z direction. So instead of dealing with just the magnitudes of the forces, we have to start dealing with the components of a force. And in the next video, I will be going over the geometry and trigonometry used to actually calculate those components. But the reason why I wanted to make this video is to help you guys break away from using forces as magnitudes. So yes, if we had a box and we loaded it in this direction and we had another opposing force in this direction, and let's say that it was 100 pounds and 20 pounds in this direction, the sum of the forces just comes out to be 100 minus 20. Technically, these are magnitudes, but really what this represents is a summation of the forces in the x direction where 120 aren't necessarily magnitudes, but they are just one-dimensional vectors. And since they are one-dimensional, it's easy to get tricked into thinking that forces are magnitudes. So when we start applying these ideas to two dimensions and three dimensions, we need to start treating them as vectors. So anyway, thanks for watching. And if you guys have any more questions, whether it's on a different topic or whether it's homework problems, feel free to send them in and I will make a video for you.